All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Robert Schaeffler from Web Interpret. Um, I won't introduce myself for too long because we have we have a lot to cover. I'm going to talk about uh, writing compilers, about parsing input, and about ply, about a tool to do it in Python. Um, a warm-up question. What is a lathe? Does any, anyone of you know what a lathe is? Cool. This is a lathe. It's a tool. It's a machine tool. It's almost like a drill, but working horizontally. Um, it has two ends, a tailstock, and whatever the other one is called. You use it to machine metal mostly. It's cool in that um, it's a pre precision tool. Um, and it's used to, to process a lot of things that are used to build other tools. So many, many of of the things that you can see around here are made using tools that are made using lathes. Um, so, so a lathe uh, is like a drill and uh, it can do a lot of cool stuff, but a drill, not so much. You can basically drill holes with it. It's, it's not, not that cool. Um, it's not good for your career, okay? Using a drill will not get you a lot of fame and money. Now, uh, what does it what does it have has to do with uh, Python? Mm. We have uh, regular expressions. This I, I believe uh, most of us know what these are. Uh, they are simple, mostly. Yeah, they are useful. Although um, they are used mostly to process simple things, so like they are they are us useful in in a way that uh, a drill is useful. So a drill is good to, to drill holes, and regular expressions are useful to process simple things like CSVs or I don't know some simple text files. And they can get awkward, using them can get awkward when you are trying to process um, more complex things. And this is exactly the case with drills. They get awkward too. If you need to do something sophisticated with them, they are not the best tool to do it. So, um, Sometimes you, you, you need to um, process some uh, structured input like HTML or XML or whatever, JSON. Mm, regular tools are not good for that and you need context-free grammars to do it. What are context-free grammars? Um, first, uh, this is it's a regular expression. Um, what what it means um, on the theory level is that this thing defines this language. Uh, it defines language of words made up of A's and B's. That's simple. And this is a context-free grammar. Um, Context-free grammars are um, built of productions. Productions are really rules. It's, it's a fancy name for a rule. Um, they are their um, simplest building blocks are terminal symbols. These are the parentheses here, the plus, the multiplication sign, and some numbers probably. In this example, um, what makes context-free grammars uh, sophisticated is non-terminal symbols 
and they can be used to build complex ex expressions uh, in a recursive way. So um, an expression, this E is for expression, um, in, in this example can be um, a number or something in parentheses or it can be built from two expressions by placing a plus or a multiplication sign between them. Um, right. This is this is the language that, that this this grammar defines. It's it's a language of simple mathematical expressions. Quite obvious. Um, uh, when when we, when we need to process some input, uh, and we want to use. Uh, tools like regular expressions and context-free grammars, uh, we get into lexing and parsing. Uh, lexing is just processing the low level, the, the, the input on the low level using um, regular expressions. And parsing, in this case, is applying context-free grammars to understand the deeper structure of input. It goes like this. This is the input. It's just just a string of characters or a string of bytes. Uh, what the lexer does is it splits this input into smaller pieces. Um, these are like the simplest uh, pieces that that our system understands. Um, in this case, it's some simple symbols and. Identifiers, let's say. These are called um, tokens uh, in in the language of lexers and parsers. And what what a parser does is it takes this um, pre-processed input and builds something called a parse tree from this. Now. Um, to understand what a parse tree is, um, we should take a look at the abstract, the abstract view of things, and the abstract view of uh, of parsing and uh, of um, context-free grammars is that actually what we need to do is understand this input in terms of things like this, in terms of its structure, and this this abstract structure, this. Um, way to uh, understand this input is called an abstract syntax tree. Uh, this is, ba uh, this is um, usually uh, encoded in, in uh, concrete terms using some objects. This is, this is quite, quite common in, in parsing systems that um, you just decompose the input into uh, a recursive structure using uh, objects like objects in Python, so instances of classes, or I don't know, maybe objects in Java, whatever. Mm, now, uh, what we have here uh, is two systems Two, two subsystems working uh, together to process the input to understand its structure. And what, what this is, is basically um, the, the first half of, of any compiler, or maybe the first 10%. It depends. Um, what, what you would... Uh, what you, you would need to, to build a minimal compiler would be just add a code generator to, to a parser. Because uh, once you have the input uh, in a tree version, in, in, in the form that um, reflects its internal structure, all you need to do to um, turn it into, let's say, running, uh, running machine code is to walk over the tree, perform some operations to 
just uh, spit out some some bytes of, of the output. This is this is actually not very trivial. I will not talk about it <laughs> because because I want I wanted to uh, focus on parsing. Uh, one important thing uh, to remember about uh, when you apply abstract things like context-free grammars or, or s such um, mathematical concepts to to the practice of uh, of processing input is that um, in the end uh, you have you have to be sure um, that the input is parsed um, in one and single way. So uh, even if uh, our grammar um, would allow this input to be understood in this way, we would expect we would expect the correct way to be this. Actually, so um, what I'm tr trying to tell you is that uh, it's it's very important. Um, which way or, or or in which form our uh, parsing system understands things okay so for example order matters and so on right um ply in the beginning there are some uh guys in AT&T in the 70s guys with long beards they uh, invented Yak and Lex. Yak and Lex were uh, the first uh, practical tools to, to build uh, non-trivial um, compilers or parsers. What they did uh, is, uh, what they do actually, they are still used, uh, is they take some uh, definition, some definitions of grammars or definitions of um, rules for um, understanding input and they generate some C code that uh, uh, that parses input then then the, the, the new project uh, appeared at the end of 80s and Yak and, and Lex were rewritten into Flex and Bison mm. and there, was, there was a host of uh, follow-on projects really many follow-on projects and ply is one of them ply is actually just lex and yak implemented in python mm. to give you a perspective uh why this is important uh, this is this is a short list a very um very concise list of uh, projects where lex flex yak or bison are used It's quite impressive. Actually, um, most systems that uh, in that that have uh, some structured for form of input uh, would need to use a tool like this. Not ne not necessarily Yak or Bison, but something similar. This is Ply um, Python Lex Yak. Uh, it's two things in one. It's it uh, can generate lexers and parsers, uh, so so the two basic uh, levels of uh, processing input. Mm, Ply is a mature project. It's it's been written uh, for like ten years plus. It works under Python three, so so it's quite quite um, modern. It's it's very simple to use because it's written in Python. Okay. So let's let's get to some code. Um, this is this is my idea of uh, storing things in the parse tree. Uh, it's um, I wanted to uh, to have um, as my input. I wanted to have uh, some simple mathematical expressions uh, that would include addition and multiplication uh, symbols and variables so I just invented some classes that would be used to hold information about them they uh, they know basically how to create themselves 
for, for the variable, it just knows how to build itself using a variable name. And in the case of uh, addition and multiplication symbols, they know how to be built using um, its left hand and right hand um, sub-expressions. Um, this is this is quite basic, and it also includes a uh, string function to uh, to take a look at this uh, as we build it, and uh, a evaluation function that will be used to to show you that uh, this this um, parse tree that the concept is actually practical in a way that we can build uh, something that, um, uh, for example, computes some results based, based on our input. How does it work? Uh, it works like this. You build um, variable nodes using their names. And from this, you build, for example, a multiplication node and an addition node. That's all. This, this expression uh, prints out like this. So it's, it's been built and it's complete. And it knows how to compute something. It knows how to compute something uh, when I pass it some variable bindings, some values for, for variables. All right. Uh, this is much simpler. <laughs> um, as I told you before, um, uh, lexical analysis, or what lexers do, is basically applying regular expressions to input. Uh, plus, they know how to interpret the input on the lowest level. So perhaps they know how to open files, read them, or I don't know, maybe handle Unicode, things like that. But basically, it's just a bunch of regular expressions. Um, so, so I put actually three simple expressions here the addition sign the the multiplication sign and um, a regular expression for a variable these are pretty obvious uh, I also included uh, a uh, ignore rule a ignore um, regular expression what this means is that um, in the input, when when some white space is encountered, it will be ignored, so so we will be able to use white space in input. Ain't that great? Um, uh, how ply is used is basically you import the module ply lex and um, specify your rules here with the prefix t, run lex lex and knows how to do everything inside. It builds some uh, internal objects. It generates the, the lexing code. And that's it. After it's built, it's used like this. You provide it with input. Um, you loop uh, over input by calling apply lex token. Mm which basically extracts subsequent tokens from input. If you encounter something that uh, doesn't evaluate to true, uh, it's, it's an end of input, so, so we break out of this loop. What I did here is uh, I, I showed what, what the output of, uh, uh, of lexical analysis is, and the output is a series of um, tuples that encode subsequent tokens. This thing is defined here. Um, the second part uh, is uh, the value, like the string value of, of the token. It's, it's basically the match of, of the regular expression. Uh, it also has some information about when it has been encountered. So th there is a line number and... Um, and a character number, but this does, does, doesn't, it's, it's not interesting to us at this point. Okay, 
So the, the main point of, of, this, uh, of this presentation is uh, that while building a lexer, a lexical analyzer using regular expressions is quite trivial and in fact you could do it by hand quite, quite simply. Um, what Ply really, where, where Ply really gives us uh, some substantial power is building parsers. So uh, the, the part that is um, more, more powerful is processing context-free grammars. Again, it's uh, very simple to use. You just import apply yak. Um, you have to know your... In, in, in this case, I, I wanted to introduce my uh, parse tree objects, that parse tree classes that uh, I defined previously. Um, apply needs to know what our tokens are. So, so the tokens were defined uh, in, this, in this part. These are the tokens. It needs, it needs to know uh, what these are in order to connect the parser and, and the lexer. Um, and the most important thing, you specify the rules of the grammar, the productions, uh, in functions. Okay, so, so these this are named p something. And Ply uh, recognizes the, that these are special and they encode uh, rules uh, of the grammar. Nice hack is that uh, the structure of, of, the, of the grammar, so the, the rules themselves are encoded as doc strings. And we have three very, very simple rules here. They mean that uh, for our purposes, uh, an expression can be a variable. It can be two expression, or it or it can be two expressions built from uh, built using some addition and multiplication between them. Um, these functions uh, receive an object, uh, a p. It's actually a tuple. Uh, they receive their input. Uh, in elements p1, p2, p3, and so on, and uh, they expect the output to be put in p0. This is actually bad design, okay, but uh, it's, it's just uh, made this way uh, because most traditional tools also work this way. They also processed some objects both as input and output. Uh, so what, what these do is pretty obvious um, when uh, we encounter a variable in the input we build a variable node using using this class that we specified earlier the p1 uh, in this case is just um, the token value of of this so it's basically the um, the string that corresponds to the, to the regular expression match and uh, in, in the two more, more complex cases, uh, what this code does is uh, it builds addition and multiplication nodes, uh, again, using, using those classes that we have specified before. And uh, it knows automatically that what has been um, given in P1 and P3 is those those parts here that has been already processed? So, so uh, for example, there can be a variable there or anything more complex. It's al already been parsed and uh, it's already been uh, made into a parse tree node using those rules recursively. Mm. I also implemented a very simple form of uh, error checking. It's it's very professional, as you see. Uh, we just throw a parse error. There is a to do here. I will talk about it later, because you obviously would not do it like this in a production setting. Um, what you can also specify um, for a grammar is. Uh, 
is precedence. So uh, in the in the basic form, uh, when when you look at this uh, this grammar, for example, um, it's it's not uh, it's not obvious or actually it's not specified at all that an expression like this should be parsed as this or this, okay? So um, the parser needs to know exactly, and for it to know exactly, we specify operator precedence, and uh, operator precedence just tell, tells us that um, multiplication uh, is more is, has more binding power than addition, and they both are left associative. So uh, when, when, when you encounter several, um, several expressions connected with uh, plus signs or multiplication signs, they should be evaluated left to right. Okay, does it work? Again, uh, you just provide the parser with input um, using this. So, so the parser is, is an object returned by apply yak yak and you provide it with some input using parser.parse you can do it uh, several times in a sequence mm, these are really working actually <laughs> so uh, if, if we pass it some invalid input it correctly raises a parse error and when we, when we uh, provide it with, with correct input, it correctly builds parse trees. And these parse trees are um, presented as strings here. What is important is this thing is parsed this way, and this thing is parsed this way. It's, uh, it's the way that we would expect uh, for, for a standard mathematical notation, so operator precedence works. Cool. I'm almost finished. <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we have a grammar, a parser, and some lexer, we are actually very, very close to having some working software. Um, what, what I show you here is a calculator. A calculator, um, for example, like BC under Unix systems, okay? So, so a calculator um, takes some input. This is this. It basically takes the input from uh, console, from, from the standard input. This is the input. Um, we can parse it using this whole machinery built earlier. And uh, evaluate uh, what, is, what has been parsed, evaluate the parse tree using these variable bindings. So assuming x is 6, y is 3, and the mp is 2. And this has parsed correctly. The result after the evaluation is 42. What this really means, what this really is, is uh, a very, very simplistic and um, trivial domain-specific language. It's just a language that um, we came up with. So, um, for example, we have some project. We need um, structured input. We need um, complex input. This is the way to do it. This, this, is, this is the way to handle this input. Um, all right. Now, um, this all might sound pretty theoretic. But actually, you can make money using this, these techniques. And uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, one thing that I actually did personally with Ply and present some uh, other examples. Mm, other examples that I've seen 
uh, people to where, where uh, they use tools like ply, but not necessarily ply. And uh, this this will be simple examples that show you that this is pretty useful. The, the first the first example uh, from my personal experience is. Um, some time ago, I, I built a reporting system for, for some company. It was um, concerned with uh, industrial data. It was basically processing a lot of numerical values from industrial sensors, and they needed to be aggregated in some uh, pretty complex ways because uh, these were data like um, temperatures, pressures, um, flows like flows of fluids in pipes mm, and the company needed to uh, compute some uh, performance indexes so th th this, th this would be uh, expressions like um, the amount of fluids flowing through this node in some installation for the last 24 hours or the average average pressure in whatever for maybe the last hour or maybe the maximum temperature somewhere uh, in in last uh, three days. So what I did I uh, is I used apply to let the final user specify these uh, expressions himself because I myself as, as a programmer I did not actually know anything about the specifics of, of the project about um, the underlying business um, demands. So I just thought, well, let, let, let the user do it. It will spare me um, time supporting users. And actually, it worked out great. The, the users were very happy about this. They, they could um, specify their expressions, their mathematical equations um, for these computations. It was cool. It was uh, also, it was pretty simple to do. It took me maybe a week, a week of, of normal office work, of normal you know, office hours to, to build this, this thing. Mm. So for, for something uh, quite sophisticated like this, it's it's great, great, um, great value for not that much work. Um, other places where uh, techniques like this are used are, oh, bummer. Other places are um, custom configuration files. When, when, when you have uh, something like uh, Apache configuration file or maybe um, Nginx configuration file, these are specified using simple uh, structured input. So they are parsed by, by tools like Yak or Bison. Um, where this can uh, can come in handy is prototyping novel languages or maybe uh, prototyping changes in some languages. So th this would be excellent as a research tool. And uh, also, what is what is uh, recently becoming quite uh, ubiquitous is uh, custom domain-specific languages. We have YAML, or actually, it, maybe it started with JSON. Okay, so. So, so we have JSON, which is a very simple um, structured language. We have YAML, and there are many others. There is Gherkin uh, for for uh, specifying um, some some rules for tests. There, there is Thrift, protocol buffers. They are all um, recent examples of things that uh, can be parsed using using simple uh, parsers built with tools like Ply. Wow. Okay, so maybe um, what, what I'm trying to, to tell right now is that maybe um, in our everyday work, we won't be building um, a C compiler anytime soon, or maybe someone does. I don't. 
uh, I'd like to, but but it's it's way too too complex and way just people not pay for this. But uh, people pay for uh, for things that uh, that they can configure or they can um, just use uh, with complex input. This is very useful, and by giving them um, the option to uh, to um, use these tools uh, with complex input, you are actually empowering users, including developers, because uh, when you give your final users a complex tool, at the same time you are you're making yourself work less because you don't have to support your your user. You don't have to, I don't know, um, tell him how to tweak the system because he can tweak it himself. And what this means in the end is competitive advantage. All right. Do we have some time? Yeah, we do. For the rough edges. It all looks pretty simple, does it? I hope so. <laughs> it, it might look quite simple and, and straightforward. Well, you, you just write some rules for your grammar, you just write some regular expressions for, for the input. But in reality, it can be much more complex. First thing, uh, tools like Yak and Bison and, by extension, Ply don't actually parse any context-free grammar at all. They are limited to subsets of uh, context-free grammars. I won't go into this, but there, are, there, is, there is a substantial amount of uh, theory behind this. So, so you can just put any rules you just came up with and expect apply or any tool like this to, to just build a parser. Unfortunately, it that does not work this way. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, the, the amount of power that, that these tools possess is pretty enough for, for most users. And uh, a proof of this is actually that GCC from the beginning was using um, Bison. Well, maybe not from the beginning, but pretty soon after, after the beginning, they were using Bison. And uh, if a tool is, is able to process C++, it means that the tool has to be pretty powerful because the grammar of C++ is, is a huge mess. It's a very, very, very complex thing. Um, the second problem is um, there are conflicts in grammars. So grammars, uh, we would like them to be um, unambiguous. We would like to, to have uh, the parser always parse input in one way and only one way. And um, specifying this, achieving this, this goal might be non-trivial. Um, the example I have shown you before, the simple example with uh, multiplication and addition is, is uh, one case of this phenomenon, but actually uh, even with, with uh, operator precedence and rules for associativity, you still can, can be left with some conflicts in, com in complex grammars, and resolving these conflicts can be very painful. And last thing that could be hard is uh, handling errors. This is, this is uh, the thing I've I left uh, a to-do comment in the code. I was just throwing a parse error there. But uh, in a real realistic system, you would want to show your user the exact place where he made a mistake, the exact place where there is an error, and it's hard in general. Mm. This, this tools uh, contain some substantial hacks to um, let you uh, pinpoint the, the, the exact place where the input uh, does not parse. But uh, anyway, it's hard. And 
it's, it's the reason that actually GCC dropped Bison at some point and they went for a handmade parser, handwritten parser. All righty. Yeah, we are pretty much done. And uh, this, is, this is time for questions, but I would like to just say that we are hiring a web interpret. All right, questions? Okay, so uh, I have a question about uh, a bit uh, advanced things uh, on the compilers. Uh, is there a way to use Ply for uh, checking types, or you have to use some? Uh, uh, no, um, Ply is just a tool. As the name suggests, it's just Lex plus Yak, so it's just a tool to build lexical analyzers, the, the, the most uh, straightforward part of processing input, and the parser, so, so the part that, um, that understands the input in terms of context-free grammars. Uh, it ends at this. It does not contain uh, any um, code that would uh, help you, for example, check types or uh, rewrite the parse tree or do anything beyond parsing. You would have to code this uh, by yourself. And actually, I am not aware of, of any widely used or, or um, tools uh, in Python for checking types. So, so I guess you would just have to, to write this by yourself. Thank you. How fast is it and uh, how does it work? Is it just like an overlay over the uh, native uh, C stuff taken from Lex Yak or is this imp uh, implemented in Python and how big how big stuff can you can you actually parse um, this? Obviously it's not as fast as uh, the original Lex and Yak or Bison and Flex uh, that were written in C and in fact Mm. The original tools are extremely optimized things because they were they were developed for a long time. So so they have some crazy optimizations and and they work very very fast. I mean the parsers generated by them work very very fast fast. And uh, Ply is not as sophisticated because actually as as I counted uh, it just yesterday, Ply is around five thousand code itself. So uh, it, it does not uh, seem to generate uh, the most, uh, the most uh, for, for example, the, the most compact uh, parse tables possible. And it also does not implement uh, any of the speed up hacks that, that Bison knows. So, so obviously it's, it's uh, a lot slower than, uh, than the original C thing. But um, compared to other projects uh, in Python that are used to, to parse structured input uh, and uh, especially tools to process context-free grammars, actually Ply is the fastest of them, as far as I know. So um, it's pretty fast overall. <laughs> But uh, uh, obviously, you would uh, you would not want to use it to, for example, parse uh, real-time data, uh, huge amounts of real-time data. It, it's it's not a tool for for this. It's, it's I, I see it more as a tool um, to do things like uh, you know, letting users input some some structured stuff and and for your project to to understand this input. Okay, so no more questions. Thank you very much.